Sponsored by Displate. This is the sound that dominated a decade of drama TV. The Game of Thrones theme is one of the most recognisable cultural touchstones of the 21st century. Being attached to the biggest thing ever certainly helped, but it's a marvellous piece of music on its own, and I would say that Ramin Djawadi's soundtrack played an invaluable role in making this show a worldwide phenomenon. But what makes Djawadi's music so good that nobody ever skipped the opening credits of Game of Thrones, not a single time in the history of anything? Well, in addition to being the world's busiest dragon nerd, I'm also a guy who knows a thing or two about music. I've been teaching this stuff in one form or another for over a decade, and I've got a fancy piece of paper that says I spent a few years in an old fancy building, so hopefully I can distill and explain to you some of Jawadi's genius. Shut up, it's clever. To clarify, we're talking about the original opening credits of Game of Thrones, not the tweaked versions for Season 8 or House of the Dragon. Let's start with the basic elements of the entire piece. I mean really basic. The general goal of a title sequence is to prepare the audience for the overall tone of the show and place them in the series setting, and you know, credit the people involved. Game of Thrones calls for a mature and adventurous atmosphere fraught with danger but tinged with hope, grand and serious in style, epic in scope. While the visuals help to convey these latter qualities, it's the music that does most of the work in establishing the specific character of the story. The title sequence itself is a journey across a fantasy realm, so that's what Jawadi wrote, a musical journey across a fantasy realm. We'll get into what makes something sound like a journey in a bit, but first, what does fantasy sound like? In most cases, a fantasy score tries to invoke a colourful past. To a Western audience, this typically means symphonic orchestral instrumentation, monstrously large string sections, full percussion outfits, woodwinds for colour, and enough brass to make Wagner blush. Yeah! And in the case of Game of Thrones contemporaries, a full range choir. This massive, complex instrumentation emerged pretty late into classical music history. We're not talking about the delicate intricacies of Mozart or Haydn, we're talking the explosive, emotional drama of Tchaikovsky, Mahler or Holst. Less classical and more late romantic. It's the sound of John Williams. Make sure you turn the volume down when you open Dark Souls 3. To set Game of Thrones apart from other fantasy series, Jawadi opted to be more restrained with his instrumentation, where Merlin, for example, opens with this soaring, yearning, heroic melody played by full violin and cello sections and brass before too long. Game of Thrones introduces itself with a solo cello declaring a stately, poised motif. The title theme only uses strings, percussion, and a single part choir in the last section. It's comparatively modest, markedly simple, passable, plain. You could even call it humble. While brass, winds, and full choirs do feature elsewhere in the Game of Thrones soundtrack, the score is overall so stringy that their inclusion is an exception, a feature. Not to mention the striking appearance of the piano so late into the series. None of this is to declare that one of these ways of doing things is better than the other. I'm just pointing out how Jawadi sets his soundtrack apart from its kin while still maintaining the aesthetic of medieval fantasy, namely by primarily using the string orchestra as his default instrumentation instead of the full cinematic orchestra. So that's the fantasy atmosphere covered, but what makes this piece of music a journey? To answer that, I'm going to delve into the details of the composition itself. But first... 
Today's Glingus production is proudly brought to you by this plate, and that plate, and these plates. Conventional posters don't really work for me because the tiny murderer I live with likes to shred paper. Yes, I'm talking about you. Don't you give me that look. This plate makes posters out of this newfangled metal stuff, which is perfect for me. Metal posters means magnetic hanging, which means no nails in the walls or those annoying adhesive strips. Great for rentoids like myself, because for some reason landlords don't like it when you put holes in the wall. The whole thing takes less than a minute to install. Stickers on the wall, magnets on the stickers, poster on the magnets, and you're done. But what's even perfecter about this plate is their truly massive selection of prints to choose from. From independent artists to licensed merchandise from huge brands, this plate has a million billion designs to choose from, so you're bound to find something that represents your passions if you have any. I picked these three Game of Thrones posters for my office. These two are from the beautiful Death Collection, which you can find at displate.com slash Gulitis. I thought the Fire and Blood key art would look good between them. I was right. And this Avatar one for elsewhere in my house. Continuing the perfection streak, Displate somehow shipped these posters to me from Poland in like four days? I live under a rock on the sea floor, so most international deliveries take like two weeks to get here at least. I was so impressed with this that I had to ask if they fast tracked the delivery just for little old me, and no, they did not. That's normal. So get your cat proof poster teleported to you today at displate.com slash Glidus. Links in all the places, and use code Glidus at checkout for up to 40% off your purchase. The bigger the purchase, the bigger the discount. It's like science. It's not like science! Thank you Displate for sponsoring this video and for making my walls less boring. I'm going to try and make this approachable, but it will get a bit technical at points. Music theory has a tendency to take on the sound of arcane wizardry, so there'll be some supplementary information on screen that you might want to pause to read. And feel free to ask for more information in the comments below. Or you could just ask me on Twitter and I'll tag Adam Neely for you. Alright, I'm just gonna let the thing play and I'll pause it when I hear something I want to dig into. Stop right there! This is the beating heart of the Game of Thrones theme. The engine room that keeps everything going. Even if you can't read music, you know what this is. Dum dum digger dum dum digger dum and so on. I've written it in the 6-8 meter here. Some folks write it in a fast 3-4 or 6-4. I've seen it in 12-8 as well. I can see why you'd want to do that, but Ramin counts it in 6, so I will too. One, two, three, four, five, six. Whatever time signature it's in, the beat, the basic rhythmic unit, is divided into thirds as opposed to half. Halves. Compare 4-4's four 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and to 6-8's 1 and 2 and Simple time versus compound time. Compound time has a sort of inherent natural forward momentum that often gets described as a jaunt or a lilt. Each beat falls into the next one. Dum dum digger dum dum digger dum dum. The digger simultaneously acts as the end of the previous beat and a lead into the next one. I think this is one of the bigger reasons that the piece feels active, like a journey, like it's going somewhere. Jawadi has this repeated rhythmic figure, this ostinato riff motif, whatever you want to call it. He has it playing all the way through the tune. There are slight deviations, but I mean, you've heard the song. And you know that this rhythm is the dominant motif of this theme and of Game of Thrones. But there's more to this figure than just its rhythm. We start at the top, drop down, then climb back up, looping ad infinitum. So just like its rhythm, the pitch of this motif propels itself forward into the next iteration. It can go on forever, generating its own energy. These pitches also outline a chord. That's the fifth root and third of a C minor triad, falling on the main divisions of the beat. Dum dum dig. The fourth note doesn't fit into this, it's not a chord tone, but it doesn't fall on a main division, it's the guh of the digger. No one's listening for the guh in dum dum digger dum dum. It's all about the dums. So this fourth note is a passing note, it doesn't meaningfully contribute to the chord suggested by the figure, it just fills the space to get us where we need to go. If you take it out, the rhythm becomes incredibly boring, so it's still vital, but it's connective tissue. Further strengthening the dums is that they make up a perfect fifth, which is one of the strongest, most conclusive intervals. So so we get this downward perfect fifth on the heaviest part of the rhythm, then the delicate emotional third to complete the chord, and finally the almost incidental fourth on our way back up. 
It's a simple figure, but it's also perfect. An ostinato that provides a continuous rhythmic drive to the piece and naturally describes the harmony at hand without stepping on itself or becoming overly complicated. Anyway, that's those four notes. What about the rest of them? Well, in a sense, that's sort of it. As the song goes on, this little figure glides around to change the piece's harmony, what chord is going on at any given point in time to match the melody. So let's talk about the melody. Fifth, root, third, then fourth. It's the same idea as the engine room. In fact, it's the exact same idea. Perfect fifth down for a strong opening statement, then a quicker climb back up to repeat. So this melody, Juwadi just took the motific core of the piece and stretched it out. That's what we call rhythmic augmentation. He's nesting the same idea at different levels in the tune. It's like a musical fractal. Now, this idea is ancient and it's been used to far more complicated heights, but that's no points off from me. It builds familiarity. The melody feels like it's intrinsically connected to the background because it is. I think this contributes to this piece of music being such an earworm. Giving the melody larger rhythmic values than its accompaniment keeps it simple, singable, and memorable. It allows the accompaniment to drive the piece along, giving the melody more room so it feels grander, more poised. Further contributing to that quality is the instrument of choice. Out of the instruments Juwadi chose to work with, the solo cello is arguably the most similar in timbre to a human voice. It's dark and rich and vibrant, clear and emotional. The melody repeats this basic idea, but this time the first two notes are a little shorter, which builds a bit of momentum, propelling towards the final note of the phrase, and it lets that final note fall on a downbeat, ushering in a chord change at the same time. This helps keep the tune strong and coherent, both rhythmically and harmonically. Again, it's simple stuff done right. We get to this long held note which occupies the whole second half of the phrase. Long notes on their own are sort of boring, so Juwadi brings the riff back in on the strings to provide a textural change and some pitched material to coax us along into the next phrase. You might not have even noticed that it dropped out so the melody has some breathing room to introduce itself to the audience. But your brain did. Yeah, when the cello comes in, it's just it, percussion, and the bass for a couple of measures until the long note. There's also a chord swelling in the background here, which I think might actually be strings and brass. So I lied about that, but it's hardly a feature. It's a choice to add some depth, like a teaspoon of espresso in a chocolate brownie. Most people People won't notice its presence, they won't taste the flavour, but they will feel its effects. So my point stands about how Jawadi defaults to strings and how that sets his score apart from other fantasy franchises. That entire phrase gets repeated practically verbatim, one diatonic step down. The quick flourishes are inverted for variance and coherence, my guess is that Jawadi heard how it would have gone. and thought it sounded better if he swapped those notes around. Music is heavily subjective, but he was right. Twirling around these notes honestly makes it sound a little whimsical, maybe even a bit cheeky. A glimmer of brightness through this dark cello tone in a minor key. We are in C minor, by the way. C major is probably the most familiar key to most people. It's simple, understandable, honestly a bit boring and childish, probably due to overexposure. It's the key of nursery rhymes, and the key of don't worry about the black notes yet, we'll learn those when you're older. C minor, on the other hand, is dark and mature, while still benefiting from the familiarity of having C as its tonal centre. The chord progression outlined by this melody is C minor, G minor, B flat major, and F minor, with C as our tonic, our tonal centre, our home note. That's one, five, seven, four, where those numbers are scale degrees of the C minor scale. Tonic, go up a fifth. Seventh, go up a fifth. Then to repeat, we just go up another fifth and we're back at the tonic. Very guitar-brained of you, Ramin. Just like the ostinato in the melody, this also is a cyclical pattern that thrives off its own momentum, but it does change. 
After the first time through the melody, Jawadi gives the cello a partner. It's joined by the solo violin for the second time around. This gives the impression of interplay between two characters, an indication of the political theatre and personal drama that permeated Game of Thrones until it went bad. It also expands the range of the piece, doubling the cello at the octave. So it's a subtle ramping up of the texture, and the harmony gets a minor tweak as well. The F minor chord we landed on earlier is changed to a C minor chord, the tonic. Ending the phrase with the tonic triad instead of the subdominant triad makes it more conclusive, again making things more definite as the piece goes on. It's a subtonic resolution, which sort of has a dominant function, but it's much weaker than a perfect cadence would be. With this final C minor chord comes a little alteration to the engine room. Instead of jumping down from the fifth to the root, we're actually doing it the other way around, root down to the fifth, which is a smaller jump, and then climbing back up via the sixth and the seventh. The rhythm and the general motion stay the same, but now it's a bit more tightly knit, and instead of running up to the fifth as the peak, it runs up to the root as the peak. The tonic, the conclusion, home. Third time through the melody and things are really starting to get heated. We now have the entire violin section joining the soloists in the melody, adding yet another octave to the mix. You've heard the melody twice through already, and now it's being played by a billion instruments across three octaves, so the riff doesn't have to leave room for it anymore. The rhythmic figure fills the entire space, outlining every chord now, and chucking on another octave for good measure. We're building to something now, and that's heralded by this little drawn out rhythmic variation to the melody's ending here. Another alteration to the engine room happens as well. For the first time, we hear it outlining the B-flat chord, and instead of the fifth root structure we've seen so far, Jawadi writes it in second inversion, third down to fifth. Blink and you'll miss it, but leaning on the third like this, putting it on the downbeat, it makes the chord lusher, more emotive. The third of a chord is where its quality lies, what differentiates between major and minor. This piece points that out to us earlier, briefly swapping the riff from C minor to C major and back again at the beginning. There, it's done to evoke a feeling of unpredictability. Here, leaning on the third is done to emphasize the sweet brightness of the one major chord in the progression. It also flows better melodically with the rest of the riff, and it subtly introduces this variation before the upcoming section. If it didn't happen here, it might feel a bit out of place when it happens later. Speaking of, we've hit the shift. After the third time through the same melody with the texture now fully fleshed out, Jawadi takes us elsewhere. A new melody, a new mood, a new dynamic. He lets go of some of the dark tension he'd been building and lets us relax into A flat major. This is the tinge of hope. The tonic C that the previous melody finished on is a sort of pivot point, as this melody starts on C. But now it's the lush, rich, major third of that A flat chord. This new section exaggerates some of the character of the initial one, with these comparatively huge melodic intervals. It's less refined and poised now, more yearning and heroic. It's done away with all that whimsical ornamentation and rhythmic cheekiness, and is now just bashing away at these sweeping chord tones on the downbeat. The ostinato is now making full use of all the different forms we've seen it in, searing into that lush third, returning to the strong fifth structure, and then that tight-knit fourth at the end. All different methods of outlining the relevant chord. Speaking of chords, here's one of my favourite techniques for increasing intensity without changing tempo, texture, or even volume. Increasing the harmonic rhythm. In the first section, we'd been spending two whole measures on every chord. That's four big beats, four dum dum duggers, and that didn't deviate at all. A constant harmonic rhythm, and there were two chords to each phrase. In this section, most chords only get one measure, two big beats, two dum dum duggers, and there are four chords to each phrase. The chord density has doubled, the harmony is shifting twice as quickly now. We sail right through these four chords. If you've always felt that this part of the song is more emotionally intense and you couldn't put your finger on why, that's a big part of it. The melody is distilled down to its core, crying out for resolution, and the harmony is pressing on unrelentingly. Note that these four chords, A flat major, E flat major, F minor and C minor follow a similar pattern to our initial progression. A flat isn't our tonic, we are still in C minor, so this is sixth, go up a fifth, fourth, go up a fifth, six, three, four, 
one. The second phrase of the melody also starts at A flat major and gets to C minor, but instead of going through the third and the fourth, the harmony takes a more dramatic and resolute path between those chords. It goes via the fourth and the fifth, F minor and G minor. Six, four, five, one. Those two chords also only go for one dum dum dugger, one beat. So there's even more intensity and fluctuation in the harmonic rhythm, and that allows the riff to sit on the tonic C minor chord for two whole measures, and the melody to hang out on a big fat long note for gravitas. These two chords are also the only extended chords in the piece. Instead of being triads, chords with three notes separated by thirds, the snowmen, they're sevenths, chords with four notes separated by thirds, basically a triad with another note on the stack extra tall snowmen. They're called sevenths because that extra note is a seventh away from the root of the chord. Adding a seventh complicates the sound, especially in this case because the melody is playing the seventh, featuring it, emphasizing it. This added complexity is purposefully contrasted with the raw clarity of the C minor triad that the phrase ends on. Jawadi repeats this new melody, adding that third octave back in on the violins and throwing vocals in to double the treble pitches. It's just a single vocal line to enrich the drama of the tone and make it more explicitly human. Aside from that, the only difference between these two iterations of the melody is that instead of rising up from the third to the fifth at the end, we now descend from the third to the tonic. This is some Melody 101. A rising ending is the question, and a falling ending is the answer. It's just like in speech. It's just like in speech. As a result of this change, what was previously G minor 7 is now just a G minor triad, which clears things up for the final cadence. The Game of Thrones theme ends with A flat major, F minor 7, G minor, C minor. 6, 4, 5, 1. 4, 5, 1 being one of the most definite, resolute ways to conclude a progression. Listen for the gong tearing up the background as the melody reaches its final note. That is strategic gong deployment. I'll teach you that at Berkeley. A massive crescendo, foreboding the dramatic heights of this show's story, swells through the ostinato as the last two bars blaze on. And when it's over, when the explosion is done, we're left listening to the smoldering embers. This tiny coda, the final statement of our central motif in its tightest form so as to end on the tonic, is played on cantele and dulcimer. These are both zithers, string instruments played by striking the strings instead of bowing them. Their unfamiliar, eerie, old world, folky tone shimmers unobstructed in the aftermath of this drama, evoking mystery, unease, and intrigue, drawing your attention and pulling you into the world of Westeros for the next hour or so. But hey, that's just a theory. A music fe- I've got some closing thoughts about the Game of Thrones theme, but first I thought I'd ask if you'd like me to do this with any other pieces of music. Uh, leave your suggestions in the comments below. It can be from the Game of Thrones soundtrack or not from the Game of Thrones soundtrack. There is music that exists outside of this franchise, I've been told. No, no, no. I don't think it's likely. Um, if you liked the video, do the thing that expresses that. If you didn't, eh. <laughs> The Game of Thrones theme is around 100 seconds long. This is getting into the longer side of credit sequences, but it's considerably shorter than the likes of Twin Peaks and Too Many Cooks. Too many cooks. It hits a sweet spot of feeling substantial without drawing on too long. But broadly speaking, how does it use its time? 
Well, after a few introductory measures that establish and then cheekily play with the main motif, there's no stuffing about. It states its melody clearly and then iterates on it two more times, each time tweaking the instrumentation and texture, piece by piece growing towards the climax. The same pattern is truncated with a new, related melody. It's only repeated once this time, before culminating in a similar resolution to the initial melody and rounding it out with a coda that reflects the opening. Not a single moment is wasted and pretty much all the pitched material is derived from just that opening gesture. That is to say, it is maximally efficient and as tightly constructed a piece for this purpose as you could ask for. So next time you listen to the Game of Thrones theme, try and appreciate the brilliant craftsmanship involved in its composition that keeps you not skipping it for 73 times in a row. Listen out for some of these details I've pointed out, or see if you can find more. I didn't even touch on the diegetic sounds sprinkled throughout, or the specifics of the percussion, and don't limit it to just this one little tune. If you love a piece of music, chances are it's because some wonderfully talented and passionate musician or group of musicians spent lifetimes developing the skills and intuition necessary to touch that part of your mind, if you'll permit a bit of wankery. Take a moment to consider that when you listen to the music you love. Even if you're not so musically literate, just try. Anyone can think about art, and you can talk about it with your friends or innocent bystanders, and who cares if you don't know the right words? Anyway, buy a metal poster. In conclusion, Ramin Jawadi is really handsome and that doesn't get talked about enough.